So, all right, Matthew chapter number 9. Now, as you're beginning to learn, you're beginning to see and beginning to understand that when the Bible refers to the heart, it's referring to the thing that's uh, located in your head. And uh, it's not located in the center of your chest. There are some references uh, in the Bible that I've given you already that refer to the physical beating of the heart. But the Bible is written in such a fashion as to, uh, to try to make parallels or comparisons, uh, oftentimes using that and or contrasts. You say, well, why is that important? Well, if you don't have a heart, you don't have life, right? So when you think of the heart, you think about the thing that provides the pump or the muscle that produces the, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without a heart to pump the blood, you die, right? So you have a heart attack and then you wind up dying because you can't get it to the extremities. We went over the other day and talked about hypothermia and how the body begins to shut down the extremities first and then it begins to close down the things that are only necessary to life and you have to ask people in the medical profession what they are. But believe it or not, uh, one of the last things left is besides your heart and your lungs to be able to breathe, uh, you can do those two things and then your brain begins to close down. So what's important for you to see is, is the parallel that the Lord is trying to give you a, 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 uh, an understanding that if your heart is good, then your physical health is good, meaning the physical heart. But if your heart is bad, then your physical health is bad, right? Yeah. It's a small organ. It's about the size of your fist. It's not that big. It's not nearly as big as the liver. It's not as big as either one of your two lungs. Uh, it is definitely a little bigger than the kidneys, or so I've been told. But the bottom line is this something that small can have that big of an effect on you and you only have one of them. So what the Lord's trying to do is, is to point out some things and what I believe he's laid upon my heart to try to show you is, is to help you to understand that having that thing in fellowship with the Lord is the key to a successful Christian life. Amen. And so a lot of times when we talk about walking in the spirit and not walking in the flesh and we use the word heart, sometimes we have uh, not enough information. I won't say that you're malinformed or ill-informed. I will say that not enough information for you to be able to understand clearly what you need to work on. You need to change the way you think. When he talks about thoughts and he talks about emotions and he talks about feelings, he talks about grief, the things that we covered on Wednesday night, uh, the morality, your spiritual life, grief, the desires, the affections, the perceptions, understanding, your ability to reason, that all comes from the heart. And the Lord's not interested in working on your intellect, the, the side of your brain that learns information and is able to be able to apply that information. Uh, let's say that you wanted to learn how to become a, a scientist or a mechanic or a teacher or a doctor, lawyer, whatever it would be. The intellectual side has to kick in because there's certain things you have to know about a specific task that you learn how to do. That has to do with intellect. What we're talking about now is everything over and above that. Uh, and it's not a right-sided brain or a left-sided brain and those kind of things. That's as different as the people that are around. Some people think more the right side than they do the left side and etc. We're talking about something that we all have in common, and that is not how our intellect takes care of things, but how our heart thinks about things. The Lord says in uh, Romans chapter number 3 that you can be saved if you believe where? In your heart. So in other words, it has to be something that affects your will and it affects your emotion. You can't change if your heart's not changed. Amen. In other words, if you don't have a change of heart, you can't get saved. You can know it intellectually. Now the old statement is said, and it was coined by uh, Southern Baptists a long time ago. It doesn't make Southern Baptists wrong. It does uh, help you to maybe to understand that there are certain things that they say that we kind of run off the deep end with on occasion. But the thing that you have to recognize is, is that uh, when he says, or when some people say you missed uh, heaven by 18 inches, what they're trying to say is, is that you know it in your intellect, but you don't know it in your emotion. You don't know it where love is. Love is an affection. Before you go to Matthew 9, come over and look, if you will, in Galatians chapter 5. Let me see if I can sort of give you a, a better understanding of this. Now, my purpose of doing this for you is not to put you under conviction. It's to, uh, it, it's to try to help to inform you that, that um, Brother Lynch used to say, you know, if I, uh, if I hit you in the head when I was preaching, then I'm a bad shot. 
because he said, I'm aiming at about the third button on your shirt, meaning I'm trying to affect your heart. Now, that's just an illustration because if a person doesn't have a change of heart, they're not going to have a change, listen carefully, in their character. And if they don't have a change in their character, they're not going to have a change in their destination. Somebody can know what's right to do. Well, then why don't they do it? Because their heart's not affected. If their heart changes, then you got a problem. You know what he says? He says uh, to the prophet there, he said, give me thine what? Heart. I want to know the feeling side of you, the emotional side of you. I know some of you men are getting a little bit nervous now and you think we're getting a little touchy-feely and charismatic-y. But I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of your makeup, and I might even say the majority of the sin that you commit in the day and time is not a sin of intellect, it's a sin of heart. It's your heart is divided. And so when, if you don't pay attention to some of the things I'm going to show you, you're going to always struggle with the flesh and the spirit. And you say, why? You get this idea that I know what to do in my intellect and I can discipline myself to do it, but that doesn't mean you've changed. For example, you take a guy and you get him convicted in the court of law down there at the courthouse and he gets convicted, let's say, of, uh, oh, uh, let's say he gets convicted of uh, robbery. And he committed it with a gun, so he's got a minimum of three years and then, you know, up to 25 or life or whatever. And so they put him down there and he goes into the prison system and they send him to, uh, let's say he goes to Rayford. He gets down there in Rayford and the first thing they do is, is they bring him in, sit him down to the barber chair and they shave his head. And then they give him a set of orange pajamas or down there they wear blues. And so they got on his prison blues and stuff like that. And they tell him when to get up and they tell him when to go to bed and they tell him when to go to the recreation and they tell him when to come to eat and they tell him all the things he can do. And he's not allowed to smoke and he's not allowed to watch the television and he's not allowed to do all this. And he learns pretty quickly, I need to conform to those things in order to get gain time so I can get out. Then he gets out and all he's learned is, is how to intellectually conform to what the rules are to make it easy on himself. But did it change the person? No. If he doesn't go, which is where we'll go this morning in the morning message, if he doesn't go there to repent of what he is, not what he did. If he doesn't understand that godly sorrow, the repentance there, is the kind of repentance that says, I'm sorry for what I am. You can't get Christians to do that. That's a, that's a decision of the heart. I'm the problem because of what I am, not I'm sorry because of what I did. Do you see the difference? Now, if you put both of them side by side in a prison, you can't tell the difference. You can't tell them apart. They both are wearing the same prison clothes. They're both going to the same meetings. They're both doing the same things. One comes out and never goes back. One comes back or gets out, goes and does the same thing. And it's a revolving door. You say, what's the problem? One changed in his head. The other one changed in his heart. That's the difference in the two. Victory in the Christian life comes when you deal with God in reference to what you are in your heart not your head. You can know what to do. I know you know what to do because I can watch you when you get jammed up sometimes. You even know the verses to quote. But there's a difference in applying the verses because God has laid it on your heart by conviction and putting those verses in place to get your uh, 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 backside out of a vice. You feel the squeeze coming, so you know what you do? You begin to work a deal, and you think to yourself, okay, how can I get out of this thing, and what's the best way out of this thing? And before long, you figure out a way to get out, and you wound up working out a deal, and everything works out. But you never repented of who you are. You're just repenting of what you did. The fact of the matter is, it's what you did because of who you are. But you don't fix the root of the problem. That's why you have recidivism. Now, yeah, yeah, that, that's just a fancy word for repetitiveness where when you come out, and I didn't check it, I didn't have time to check the new statistics, but in the state of Florida, it was higher than 78% the last time I checked it. Now, if it's called a correctional facility, okay, then we're failing. It started off as a penal facility. It was called a penitentiary Penitent is the root word of that. You say, what? You're paying for a crime. You're not there to be corrected. You're there to pay for what you did that's wrong. 
Now, I'm, I'm not going to make a political speech here, but what you have to understand is, is it's funny how they never tell you, you're building more prisons in the state of Florida right now. You say, why? We keep having a crime problem. Why do we have a crime problem? Because there's no change in heart. You're trying to address a heart problem with head problem. I mean, with head uh, remedies. You can't fix it by fixing their head. You can confine anybody and make them conform. But you see, here's the funny thing about the Lord. The Lord didn't come to put you in confinement. He came to check out your heart. Well, if your heart's not right, you know what'll happen? The first opportunity for you to do something you shouldn't do, you know what you do? You go right back to doing it again. You say, why? You never repented of who you are. And you can't get fixed. Your heart hasn't been replaced. I didn't say you weren't saved. Now, what I'm going to show you here is this. When it comes to this thing about emotion, and emotions are real... You say, oh, I'm, I'm a man. Uh, okay, all right. You ever get angry? What is anger? Is anger hitting a wall? Throwing something? What, what is anger? Can you show me the, the physical uh, uh, anger? Can you show me that in a physical manifestation? What, what's anger? Well, preacher, everybody knows that. Oh, you mean it's an emotion? That's the root cause of the extremities or the external or the side effects of having that at the problem. How about this one? What is bitterness? Can you manifest that to me? Can you show me what bitterness is? Is it a clenched fist or clenched jaw? Can you, does this look bitter? You say, well, well no, that doesn't look bitter. That, that looks angry. Okay. But it's an emotion. You say, where do emotions reside? They don't reside in your intellect. Your intellect is benign. Your intellect receives information like a computer and then processes the information and out comes the intellectual side of things. If I put up here A plus B minus C squared times pi equals the theory of relativity, there's no emotion in that at all. No anger, wrath, bitterness, no, nothing. It's just facts. You say, what does it do? Somebody taught me facts, and then I redistributed the facts. That's your intellect. You learn how to do a job. You know what happens? Uh, let's say, let's take a, uh, well, let's take a real big one. Let's take, a, let's take a brain surgeon. They go about 12 years to learn how to operate on your noggin, right? And when they go in there, and they peel the scalp back, and they cut the hole in your scalp, and take a little thing that looks like a little baby claw hammer there, and pop that thing off and roll it back. And then here's this gray matter that looks like a whole bunch of worms and stuff in that. And, and they look down at that thing and then they have the person that's down here and they touch certain parts of the brain and they're having the person talk while they're doing it to make sure they don't interrupt the speech center and different things along the line. And that guy, you know what he's doing? He's operating based on intellect. You don't want him operating on emotion. You say, why? As soon as he cuts into that thing and the blood's, oh my God, oh my God, there's blood. Oh my God, it's a brain injury. He's going to die. Oh my God, oh, what's going to happen? And then somebody pops that thing and that thing makes sort of a click or a popping noise when you pull that thing off and there's a little space in there between the skull and the brain unless there's been some uh, swelling there. And then all of a sudden that thing pops out like that. Oh, oh my God, his brain's exposed. Oh, well, what are we going to do? No, you know what he's doing? He's, emotion, he's emotionless. He's operating on intellect. And sometimes that intellect operates with experience. I've cracked open this, done the same surgery 10 times. I've done it 100 times. I know what I need to do. He's watching over there. And the anesthesiologist says, well, the blood pressure's dropping. Okay, give him some more blood. And he keeps going like that. You don't want somebody performing that kind of a surgery when they're sitting there. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. You know why they don't like people operating or, 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 or treating people in their family? Because the emotions step in. And now when the emotions step in, watch what happened. The intellect often goes dark. You say, why? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> emotions override intellect. Haven't you seen people that know better? Did you hear that? They know better. And then they did it. And you're thinking, well, didn't you know better? You ever talk to your kid and go, don't you know better than this? <laughs> Well, why didn't they do that? Their emotions overrode it. Their appetites overrode it. 
And the next thing you know, you say, what's happened? Which is the stronger of the two? By far, by far, your emotions are stronger than your intellect. It's something everybody has. Not everybody in here has the same capacity to be able to learn things intellectually. You make a big mistake when you put everybody on the same level intellectually. Some people are gifted and God gifts them with the ability to have a huge intellect to be able to process large amounts of information and to regurgitate. That's probably not a good way to, well, anyway, to put the information back out because they have the ability to grab it, hold on to it, and then give it back out sometimes in a better, easier to understand way. But everybody can't do that. Oh, but everybody can have emotion. You say, what do you think God's dealing with? He's not dealing with your intellect. He's dealing with a woman with an issue of blood. He's dealing with a woman at the well who's had issues. He's dealing with a blind man who has not just physical issues, but emotional issues. He, you say, why is that? The Lord's interested in talking to something we all have in common. And it's not always intellect. Somebody can be mentally deficient intellectually, but they can still experience emotion. Amen. They still cry. They still get happy. They can still laugh. They can still feel sadness and grief. They can feel anger and frustration. You say, what is all that? That's not intellectual at all. That's emotion. What's God trying to do? Reach the part that drives you. You ever been real good and bad and do something stupid? Kind of, got, kind of took control of you? and overrode your <laughs> the smart side of you. You ever done that before? All right, let me show you something here. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Look in verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is in physical strength, in intellect. I must be reading from one of those living Bibles. <laughs> look, at, look at them. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Can you show me the physical attribute of that? That's emotion, isn't it? I believe it is. Where do you feel peace? In your heart, right? Where do you feel love? Can I ask you a question? If that's not where you feel it, why when comes, oh, I know Valentine's Day and the God pan and all that other kind of stuff, but in the sense of sweethearts, how come it is that when you try to give a demonstration of the word love, why do you draw a heart? Try telling your wife, intellectually, I love you because it makes sense to love you because, you know, you wash and you cook and you clean and that kind of thing. So in comparison to other people, you know, I, you know, I, you know I, I'm supposed to love you because it makes sense on paper. Okay, I'll either see you in my office or the judge will see you in divorce court. <laughs> you say, why? That woman wants your heart. Yeah. Ain't that what you want, ladies? Ma'am, can I tell you something? That's what he wants. He just don't have the backbone to tell you. He wants to know he's got your heart. Yeah, you guys, y'all are like, you know, counting the carpet weave. Well, you know, yeah, my foot. Watch. Long-suffering, gentleness. You might could demonstrate gentleness in what looks to be an outward uh, demonstration, but gentleness comes from the heart. You have to have a real care for somebody to show gentleness to them. Otherwise, it becomes clinical. Otherwise, you stand there and you watch people running around with no clothes on and they're running around in a circle and you're watching them and you're going, you know, you to the oven and you to the work camp and you to the oven and you to the work camp, you to the oven. Well, I don't care about them tears. I could care less about that. Get out of here, old woman. You go to the oven. You go to the work camp and all that kind of stuff. You say, what is it? where does gentleness come from? It's stimulated in the heart. He says that you ought to be gentle and apt to teach. You say, what is that? That's one of the responsibilities of a preacher. A preacher can't always be harsh. Sometimes he has to be like Paul said. He has to be like a nurse. Sometimes he has to be like a mother. And sometimes he has to be like a father. But there's three different applications there. There's a reproof, there's a rebuke, and then there is also, do you know what it is? Edification. So, well, it's two-thirds negative. Yeah, but a lot more mention about edification than reproof and rebuke. All right, take you a look at it and when he continues, we'll go back to Matthew 9 here in just a second. And he said, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and what? 
You know what temperance is? Sure you do. You know what temperance is. It's self-control. All right, let me say this to you. Come to Matthew, back to Matthew chapter number 9. And then we're going to run a couple of more of these that I didn't finish on uh, Wednesday night. Now, I hope this is making sense to you. I, I feel like if I can get it to make sense to you that you know what will wind up happening is that you'll begin to understand more about the flesh and the spirit. And instead of trying to battle those things out in your intellect, you'll realize the problems in your heart if you're having a hard time walking in the spirit. If I can get my heart under control, I have a better opportunity to control my flesh. But I'm telling you, it's not an easy thing to do oftentimes because we haven't explained it clearly. That's where everything, that's the issues, that's the floodgates, that's the, the wellspring of life is your heart. Just like the heart in the center of your chest is the wellspring of life. In the spiritual life, the thing is your heart. You're dead in trespasses and sin until you get saved in your heart. And until then, that, that spring is dead. It's capped off. That's why he says over there to you in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, you try to be married to somebody that's lost, you're walking in light, they're walking in darkness. That's a, that's, you, you're, you're talking about trouble, man. You can't make that thing work. You say, why? They don't have the capacity to feel what you feel. They're not touched by it. You get up and you hear a story. Um, let's say... Uh, Let's say one of the preachers here is preaching on the crucifixion. And you begin to see in your mind's eye the imagination, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the Lord paints a picture for you in there. And you see the suffering Savior up there. And you realize how wicked and ungodly you are and that He's dying for your sins. And it, and it touches your heart and a tear rolls out of the corner of your eye. And the next thing you know, man, your heart just feels burdened with grief and then gratitude. And next thing you know, you're at an altar and you're saying, not to get resaved, you're saying, Lord, thank you for being merciful to me, a sinner and all that. And there's another person sitting right there next to you and they're going, what is your problem? You ever heard of a, of a woman being broken hearted over her kids? There's a Japanese term for that that's made. I got this from one of our folks here. Doc sent it to me, but it's, a, it's made after an octopus trap. And what happens is, it's an unusual thing, but what happens is, is it's a called broken heart syndrome. And it actually happens to the physical heart because of the mental stress. Now, I'm not a doctor. I wouldn't dare go into all the details, but what they've proven is how you think can actually even affect your physical heart. So a woman's heart's broken. Well, it doesn't mean that she's got a crack in her heart. It means emotionally she's tore out of the frame. Yes. And you sit down and you try to explain it to somebody. And how are they going to connect? If they don't have a kid that went prodigal, they don't any more get you than a billy goat. That's right. You want to know how you connect when you minister to people? You got a broken heart. They have a broken heart. You understand one another. Right. Now you're on a playing field. I could only tell you it if I've experienced it. Otherwise, I have to tell you that from vicarious standpoint, meaning I'm, I, I, I can tell you about an experience. I used to have to investigate some really horrible crimes. I mean, some really, really bad things. And I would try my best to communicate and to understand uh, the victims I was talking to. I could only do it vicariously from the hundreds of cases that I did, but I can't ever say it happened to me. So there's still a disconnect because I don't know the emotional pain that is associated with that other than seeing that in other people. But I don't really know how it feels. But boy, if I could get these victims together and get them to talk. They never talked about the details of the crime. They talked about how it felt and how they felt, how they felt, how they felt after the crime. That's why if I, could, if I could help you with anything at all today, if there, anything at all, if you don't hear anything else I say for the rest of the entire day, it, you, you, you have to please recognize that sometimes when you're dealing with people that have emotional scarring, they're trying to label it now. We're famous for trying to label it and put it in a corner because if it's labeled, we think that that means we're handling it. But, it, but if you could understand the emotional scarring that some people have, have, have experienced, it's a very real thing. 
And for you to just act like, what's the big deal? Get over it. It's like you, you, you completely missed it. You'll never be able to minister to somebody that way. I know there's a time you have to kick it out of gear. You have to perform your job. You got to do whatever. But we're talking about ministering to people. You say, what? I, I know you're going to hate what I'm going to say. But what they've been through in their past can leave emotional scars that become very, very difficult for them to be able to overcome. And if you run over them and try to make them a robot past feeling, why that's Romans 1. And who being past feeling? What is conviction? Can you show me conviction? Can you show me, can you show me guilt? What, what is that? You can't show it. You can't demonstrate it. You say, what is it? It's a feeling. What does the Holy Spirit do? He works with you through your feelings. I can tell you intellectually all day long. Now, when you get under conviction, well, what is conviction? <laughs> I'll show you that this morning in this morning's message, but it's a feeling of deep contrition. It bothers you. <laughs> well, how do you know what it is if you haven't experienced it? I'm just trying to get you to see, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes when you deal with folks, you look at them from an intellectual standpoint. You don't recognize you're dealing with a living, live being that actually has feelings. Does it make you feel like you're going to throw up in your mouth when I say that? It's like, preacher, I can't believe you're talking about feelings. Well, it's where you live. It's where you live. I can, I don't know what the number would be, but I would say probably 90% of the television you watch and maybe even more than that of the internet, it's connected to try to make you make an emotional decision. I was going through a difficult thing one time, not long after my dad had passed away and stuff, and we had a pretty heavy decision to make, and I got some real good advice from an old preacher. He said, now's not a good time to be making decisions. I said, well, I have to make this decision. He said, but if you make the wrong decision, you're going to live with it for a lifetime. He said, there's nothing that you have to do that has to be done immediately. It's not life and death. He said, pause and wait until the clouds lift. That was his exact words. Pause and wait till the clouds lift. I'm glad I listened to him. You say, why? You can't see in the clouds. I didn't realize even me is... I don't know, hard or trained to myself to be able to control emotions or whatever that I was in a cloud. I didn't even know I was in a cloud. But he just had enough sense to go, not, not a good time. You know, well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I can handle it. I can do it all this and that and the other. Wait till the, wait till the clouds lift, he said. And boy, when the clouds lifted and the sun came out, I was like, I didn't even know I was in the clouds. And if I'd have made the decision, sure as I'm standing here, it'd have been the wrong one. At least I had more light on the subject. Is this making sense to you? Yes. You know what hopefully it would do? It will help you to be a little more kind to people. Yes. People do stupid things because they deal with out of the emotions of their heart. I can't help you if you've already married them. There's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> Luke chapter number 9. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 4. He swept me off my feet. I talked to you about that on Wednesday night. Warned the girls here about it. Mark chapter 9, look if you will please, in verse number uh, 4. Well, let's just pick it up in Matthew. <laughs> just seeing if you're listening. Matthew chapter number 9. Verse number 2, Behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, Jesus seeing their faith said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, you know, you've been a Bible believer long enough to know when the Lord came, He came to heal the sick because sickness was a sign of sin. So in healing the sick, He was remitting the sin. So that's why He doesn't say, be healed. He says, thy sins be forgiven thee. That's why you want to watch faith healers today. And the Bible said, Behold, certain of the scribes and within them, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing the thoughts said, Wherefore thank ye evil where? Do you see that? First of all, knowing their thoughts. Wherefore, where are they, they're, they're, what are they doing with the evil? They're thinking. Well, that can't come out of the center of your chest. That has to do with your brain. Look at Luke uh, chapter number 1. Luke chapter number 1. Show you about your imaginations. 
You want to watch your imaginations. You want to get them under control. You want to be careful. There's nothing wrong with meditating. David said, I meditate in the scriptures day and night. And the thoughts and the meditations of my heart and those kind of things. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's on the right thing. That doesn't mean you sit cross-legged on the floor and put your middle finger your, and your thumb together and you begin to call on Om, which is a God, and you try to trip yourself out of the frame and that kind of thing. No, meditation is, is I'm not blank-minded. I'm thinking on a particular thing. Whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are be of virtue, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. It's not mindless thinking. But it's good to think on those things. It's good to grab you a verse of scripture in the morning, especially if you're in a hurry and you're running out the door and you're grabbing your coffee and the kids are running around, the dog took off and broke off the leash and you finally got everything taken care of and you throw the dog back in the house and slam the door shut and you take off and you jump in the car and you know what you think, well, you know what, and crack the Bible open, put your finger on a verse of scripture and get that verse of scripture in your mind and think on it all day. So, well, preacher, I didn't get to read my 10 verse. Get one verse. Yeah. Get a couple of verses. Just get, just get you a little bit. You say, what? A little bit go a long way. The Lord understands that. I'm not one of these guys that tell you, well, if you watch three hours of TV, bless God, you know, three hours of Bible reading. Okay, well, how about an hour and a half? How about if you do three? How about give him half of it? He'll take that. He'll be fine with that. How about what you can? How about what you can? I know some of you, you got to kick it out of gear. You work all day long. You got to have a, I understand all of that. I know you're feeble and frail as dust and that kind of a deal. God doesn't give you this stuff, ladies and gentlemen, to burden you down with religion. God gives you this stuff to help you. It should be enjoyable. It should be, there should be a liberty, a freedom to it. Not this, you know, well, if you don't, I'm going to knock the tar out of you. Well, what would that prove? Some of you, it, 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 it's like you try to run your household that way. Like there's, there's no, it's, everything has a rule and regulation. Everything has to be done this way. And if it's not done this way, you know, all that kind of, you're a control freak. The Lord don't even do that with you. If he did, you know what he done? Saved you and killed you. You say, well, that's the only way you'll be perfect. You say, what does he do? He gives you time to see where your heart is. You say, what is he testing, preacher? Whether or not you love him. Do you love him? Well, keep his commandments, what he says. Yes. You love him? Keep his words. How can you keep them if you don't know what they are? Amen. So get you a little bit here and there. Get what you can. The more of it you get, the more beneficial it is to you. You know what'll happen? You're like, man, that helped me yesterday. I think I'll get a little more today. <laughs> you know what? I mean, it's like going to a good place to eat. You haven't ever been there before, right? And you sit down and you eat and you're thinking, well, yeah, it's pretty good. I think I might do what? You'll probably go back. And before long, you won't even want to see the menu because you order the same thing every time you go there because it's like, well, don't you want to try something? No, I like that. Right? Yeah, you're creatures of habit. Well, that's a good habit. Get into the book. It's bread. It's meat. It's milk. It's oil. It's water. It's honey. I mean, there's some sweet things in there. I mean, some things taste good, boy. There's some dessert in there. You say, there ain't nothing better than bread. But the Lord does this. He says, okay, you got you some bread? Yes, Lord, I got some bread. But it's kind of dry. Good. Here's you some butter. Well, I sure do appreciate that, Lord. And uh, well, while you're at it, okay, kicks over the honey bucket. And now that bread doesn't taste like cardboard anymore. Now you know what you got? You got a starch and you got some fat and you got some sugar. You got all three major food groups. And you know what you do? You walk away and go, man, that was good. That's the book. Amen. Not, I got to read the Bible. All right, let me show you this about your imagination. Luke chapter number 1, uh, verse number 51. The Bible says, he hath showed strength. Luke, there you go. 1, chapter 51. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud... In what? Who? How did he get the? How did he get mess up the proud? He let him imagine the wrong things. And the passage he says over there, he says, "You have imagined a vain thing." Look in Acts chapter number two. Watch your conscience show up here. 
You know, God gave you a conscience. You know what the devil likes to do? Defile it, dirty it, wipe his dirty shoes all over it. It gets you to thinking things that are contrary to God's Word. It gets you thinking in a modernistic fashion. It gets you thinking that popularity with the world is more, impo more important than popularity with the Lord. It gets you thinking you're too, too high and mighty and separated. <coughs> right? Who's that talking? You honestly think the Lord will go with you all the places you go? Lord's always real careful when he's sitting down to make sure that there's not fellowship. He's just sitting down to eat. There's a difference. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Yes or no? Yes. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of what? Life. He that loveth the world, is it enmity with God? That's God's enemy? Okay, you love the world and the world's ways. You want to apply the world's fashions for you to make God's church how God would do it. You think he would apply the world's ways to do it? The world says he would. Being taught in churches all over. Right now. And you're the bad guys. Because you're not worldly. You better watch it. You think the Lord had compromised to do something uh, right, to do something wrong, to get a chance to do something right? No. It's a strange thing, isn't it? But see, the world teaching you that there's something wrong with you because you're separated. There's a difference in fellowship and ministering or trying to witness to somebody. What are you so quiet about? What are you, what are you, what are you, are, are you that insecure in your own feelings that it's like, well, I don't know, well, what's the matter, Corinth? <laughs> Corinth's problem was that problem. You say, what is that? The light stays on and the bugs come to the light or they don't. Well, preacher, you know, I just feel I haven't changed how I've changed on, on that right there. I haven't changed in over 30 years. I'm not changing that. Amen. If that's what you want to do, there's plenty of churches. They have ping pong. They got basketball, football, baseball. They got soccer. You know what they'll do? They'll fish your pond. They'll come to your house and they'll try to get your kids to get your yes. kids to get the kids in church to get mom and dad in church because, hey, they got rock and roll over there. They got casino night over there. They got something for the kids. They have kids church. We don't have kids church here. We have kids Sunday school and church. Amen. They're your kids. You take care of them. Amen. You say you know them so well. Take care of them. Make them behave. You take care of them. You fix them. Amen. This idea we have something for everybody. <laughs> I don't have enough teachers to have something for all of you. Every, don't everybody in here have a problem? Yes, sir. I think so. So you want me to have a special class for everybody in here? To what? That's a hook. Yes. I got one size fits all. You say, what is it? The book. Amen. That's it. That's all there is to it. This idea, I, I know what it is. It's a carnal life. You're, you're uncomfortable because you're running around with carnal people. That's what the problem is. You're working with them. You're playing with them. You're hanging out. You just like them better than you like, you know, people like, how about me, for instance? I'm pretty sure nobody wants to hang out with you. You, ain't, you, don't, you don't know nobody. You ain't got no friends. Well, says, says who? How do you know that? But I bet maybe I don't have some of the friends you do. But it doesn't mean I don't have acquaintances and I don't try to help. I don't try to minister. I don't try to win. I don't hang out with them. You say, why? Well, that ain't my stripe. Yeah. I, I can feel it, boy. You're not going to put that kind of pressure on me. <laughs> I'm way too stubborn. I'm too old. I ain't changing. You say, what? Fire me. I'll go somewhere and do the same thing I'm doing now. I ain't changing it. Amen. We are not going to go to worldly ways. I don't care if it dries up to just us. Amen. What will we do in there? We'll all sleep on a pew. You can have your own pew and, and sleep. I'm not, that's contrary to the world's ways today. I don't care if the world likes me. I'm not supposed to. He tells me not to love the world. Say, so what is that? Pretty easy for me. I get it. Don't love them. 
That doesn't mean don't love the people that are lost. Go get them. But don't hang out with them. But I know what's happening. I know what's happening. I see it. You're listening to their music. You're watching their shows. You're going to their places. You're hanging out with them all. And before long, you spend more time with them than you do with a book. And then before long, you try to make a compromise. You got a guilty conscience. You ain't fooling me. You're trying to make me say a little bit, don't hurt. Well, you better watch it because I can tell you right now what you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. Amen. You better watch it when you start crossing those lines and kind of a, that kind of a deal. You better. The fellow asked me just a, just a couple of weeks, well, about four weeks ago now in, in uh, where I was at. And he said, you know, preacher, in this day and time in which you live, it's, it's kind of hard to, to not be. And then he mentioned a couple of things. And I said, well, brother, I said, uh, let me just ask you a question. Do you have children? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, would you want your children to be uh, with you where you were at? And he thought for a minute and he goes, well, no, I wouldn't. I said, well, then were you in the right place? I said, what about the younger brother? Look at that, boy. Look at that. You see that? A guy got up and preached an entire sermon. Am I my brother's keeper? No, you're not, Cain. Right. Yeah. Or yes, you are, Jesus. Yeah. Yes, you are, Paul. Yes. For the weaker's brother's sake, I will not partake of those things. Because it may cause a younger brother to stumble. Amen. Why? I hate to tell you this. People are watching you. Yeah. Get used to it. Yeah. Amen. They're going to watch you whether you're a Christian or not. Don't, don't put that on me. Oh, you're making yourself a spectacle. You, I spent 20 years everywhere I showed up. I was the only one in the crowd with a blue suit on. Right. With a gun and a badge. Guess what? Everybody was like, oh God. Here's the party pooper. You can walk in and literally you can walk into a fellowship and guess what? You don't have on a uniform and die. hey, can I talk? Yeah, I got stopped the other day and there was a speed trap and you know, I drove under there and a little box fell down on me and caught me in that trap, you know, and he lifted the box and he wrote me this ticket and hey, could you, can you help? And hey, we're glad you're here and everything, but can you help me? Can I just step out of that for a minute? I'm not, oh no, no, uh-uh. I was labeled whether I was in plain clothes, whether I was in workout clothes or whether I was in a blue suit. That's what I was. You say, what are you doing? You're a spectacle. Yes. Yes. Get loose, used to it. You, Jesus walk around. Don't be looking at me. Don't be judging me. Don't be thinking about... No, mm, I... Where'd you get that? You must, you must be worried because you must not want people watching you. Maybe because you're not doing things you shouldn't do. You know what the old preacher used to say? The old preacher used to say, whatever it is you're doing, would you want the rapture to happen right when you're doing it? Amen. Well, that's a good marker. <laughs> uh, no. Okay, good. That might be good not to do it. Amen. How about that? I had a boss one time. They were going to have a meeting. And he said, uh, we're going to go down to uh, Hooters after work and we're going to have a meeting and we'll kind of mix the two things together. And he said it like, the, infer the inference was, expect you to be there. And I felt that knot. You ever feel that before? I felt that knot like, uh, boy, how am I going to handle this one? Because I knew who all was going and I knew they would all go. <laughs> and I guess they could all say their wives didn't care or their wives didn't know. But <laughs> and he got to the door down there in my office and he hit the doorknob and I said, uh, with all due respect, I can't go. Boy, I'll never forget. He turned and looked at me. What do you mean you can't go? I said, Sir, uh, <laughs> I, I don't hang out in places like that. He said, Well, you can go. And I said, Sir, <laughs> I'm sorry, but unless you punch my eyes out, I'm still a man. And I don't have any business being in a place like that. Whether I drink or not, I don't have any business being in a place like that. And he said, well, the rest of us don't. I said, I'm a preacher. I'm a Christian. And sure as the world, somebody's going to see me there and they're going to think, 
Now, see, now that may not apply to you, and I don't care what you do. That's your business. But you know, if you're honest, yes. that if you knew that I went there, you know what you would do. You say, I didn't listen to anything he says. He's a stinking hypocrite. You say, why? It ain't right to do wrong to get a chance to do right. You say, what happened? I missed the meeting. Or whatever they did. I can feel that thing on me right now. That thing bothered me. It still bothered me. That's been over 25 years ago, man. You say, what is that? That's the heart. We're, we go to church. Okay. Well, so do I, but, but I still don't go. Now, you, you can handle that. You help yourself. I did ask him later on. I said, I'll just ask you a question. Do your wife care if you go to the place like that? And he said, well, she don't like it, but she doesn't have to get over it. What you going to do with that? You going to get the guys running around in uh, inappropriate attire and let them have a men's bar for women? Well, why not? I mean, so you don't think. You don't think. Acts chapter 2. Give me a couple more here. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked where? In their heart. Said unto Peter, the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we... Where were they pricked? All right, just one more. 1 John chapter 3. You say, where does the Lord deal with you on conviction? He deals with you where He just dealt with you. He deals with you in your heart. Now, you may be different than me, and I'm not saying I'm the, the, the uh, um, poster child for what I'm about to tell you. You may be different, altogether different. Some of the things that bother me, they may not bother you in the least. It might not even give you a, a second thought. If I'm sitting there flipping through that box, and all of a sudden I hit something, and I see something that's a little off color, right off the bat, I, I, I get a sense in me, yeah. keep flipping. Yeah. And then there's another thing. You know what it says? Ain't nothing you ain't seen before. Yes. What's the big deal? And that other thing says, you better keep flipping, boy. Now, see, it may not matter to you as much as me, but I'm afraid that if I don't keep flipping, he might unplug. And I have a responsibility. So then I'm getting down and I'm trying to get something to say to y'all on this kind of a deal. And the Lord said, I'm just going to flip right on by that channel. I'm going to stay plugged up to the wrong thing. And Lord, I, I mean, I realize I, nope, keep on flipping. I'll find me somebody else. That scares me. Yes. Well, that's, you know, that's a little self-serving. Okay, do with it what you want. It's, I take it serious. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm afraid of Him. I am. I'm afraid of Him. I'm afraid He'll put something on me. Ajax won't take off. I know why you do what you do. You're not afraid of Him. Verse number 20, we've got to let the kids in. The Bible says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Now he's going to give you the things there, that passage, and I'll cover them for you tonight. But what he's saying to you is, is you've got to get the right balance on what's God condemning you and what's the devil trying to condemn you for doing. And the Bible teaches you there that the Lord will show you the right things to be concerned about and the right things not to be concerned about. But you've got to have fellowship with the Lord to do it. Father, bless your word and be with us in the upcoming uh, service, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.